I'm going to tell a, a little bit about uh, sort of the story of, of how I got into uh, the questions of, of the indoor environment. And I really want to focus on simple things that we can all do, um, or at least some of us can do to, to help combat uh, COVID-19. Um, so I'm, I'm going to focus today on ways that I think are simple and low cost to, to combat COVID. Uh, there's a lot of ways in which people make uh, the indoor air environment very complicated. Uh, and my main message today is that there are ways that are simple and low cost. It doesn't have to be complicated. So that's if there's if there's anything I can teach you today uh, or that, that you can remember from my talk today, that it would be this. Um, part of the reason this is this is something that, that I'll be talking about today is that I started a group called Smart Air. Uh, this started when I was on the Fulbright uh, scholarship living in China, and I built my own DIY air purifier for less than $30 US at a time when the, you know, the, the main air purifier that people were buying cost $1,000. Um, this got some media attention. I spent a lot of time trying to publicize just the idea that um, you don't have to spend $1,000 just to breathe clean air. Now, at that time, I was I was focused on uh, air pollution, but the the underlying principles is is pretty similar. Um, I, I should say before I begin, I am not an expert in air pollution. I, I have a PhD in social psychology from the University of Virginia. I'm a cultural psychologist, which is why I've spent a lot of time in China and India and, and other places. Um, now I'm an associate professor at the University of Chicago, um, and I was a Fulbright scholar in 2012 and 2013. Um, this was in Beijing. Now, the reason that's relevant to my story is as I was doing research in Beijing, um, living in China, and then the air apocalypse struck. Uh, this was a, a time period where the air pollution was just off the charts. Um, it was hard to even see down the street the air pollution was so bad. And so I, I started to get to this question, can air purifiers protect us? Are, are air purifiers really something that, that can be helpful or are these just this marketing gimmick that companies are going to sell us? Um, and in particular, I was what I wanted to know was, can it get these really small particles, right? Um, a lot of the, the research that I was seeing was talking about pollen. You know, in the United States, a lot of people use purifiers to get, uh, to help with allergies. But pollen particles, as you can see here, are pretty large. Um, what I was interested in more was the, the smaller particles of, of smog, of PM2.5. And so what I really wanted to know was, can purifiers capture these, these really small particles um, that are associated with you know, industrial air pollution rather than the, the large sort of pollen particles? And I, I couldn't find a lot of good research on it until I found the blog of an American doctor living in Beijing, um, Dr. St. Cyr. He used this machine you can see here that's called a laser particle counter. And he did very simple tests in his apartment. Um, he would use this particle counter to test for these very small particles. And then he would just test the air in his apartment before and after turning on a purifier. And what he found was that even for these very small pollution particles, um, the purifier was reducing the amount of particulate in his room. Now he did lots of these tests, different brands, you know, different days, and the data was all very consistent. You know, turn on the air purifier, the number of particles goes down. So the answer was yes. And so I thought, great, well, my problem is solved. I'll just go out and buy one of those machines uh, that, that he bought and problem solved. But it turns out that that one cost 14,000 RMB in China. It's about 2,000 US dollars. Um, but really multiply that by two because you need one for the living room, one for the bedroom. You add in replacement filters and soon I'd be spending close to 5,000 US dollars uh, just to breathe clean air. Um, I like to joke about the Fulbright program that it is a very prestigious program, uh, but the pay is not prestigious. Um, so I didn't have $5,000 just to, just to drop on an air purifier. So my next question was, does it really need to be this way? Um, so how do these things work? I, I understand that, this, that there's a box out there that I can buy for $1,000 that will give me clean air, but, but how does it work? Um, what's inside that box that costs $1,000? Um, well, it turns out I've, I've opened up that $1,000 box before, uh, and the, the key component is a HEPA filter. There's a fan that blows air through a HEPA filter. Um, they look like this. They're just a, a mat of randomly arranged polyester fibers, like if you have a synthetic shirt, it's, it's similar to that. And they capture 99% of particles above and below 0.3 microns. So what, what that means for, for sort of everyday life is if it's a particle in your air, 
this will capture it. Now that includes a lot of things, pollen, bacteria, mold, but I'm gonna talk about viruses today. Um, researchers back in the 1960s, again, this is not new knowledge. This is stuff that we've known for 50 years. Back in the 1960s, researchers shot viruses at HEPA filters and then measured on the other side of the HEPA filter, um, are these HEPA filters capturing viruses? And what they found is that a simple HEPA filter captured 99.7% of viruses just from a single pass, right? Um, results were similar for bacteria. So I'm gonna organize the, the points today around five sort of major points. And the first one is that HEPA filters capture viruses. We know this, um, this, is, this is well established. Um, second, that doesn't necessarily mean that filtering the air is going to reduce infections. Knowing that there's a filter here that can capture viruses isn't the same as showing that it's going to actually reduce the number of infections. Um, so there's actually some recent, th th this question's a lot harder, right? Because you need real people, you need to have studies where some people are getting filters and some people aren't. You need to have real infections. And this is, that's a complicated ask for, uh, for any researcher. Um, unfortunately, uh, we've had a chance to test that in the United States recently um, with the, the COVID outbreak. Um, and so this was actually published this year um, in, in the a journal by the, the US CDC. Um, and they looked at COVID infection rates in schools in the state of Georgia. Now, some of these schools did nothing for their air. They, they, didn't, they didn't have any sort of intervention. Some of them installed HEPA purifiers, either units in their classrooms or in central air systems. And what they did is they looked at the infection rates in these schools. So in schools that did nothing uh, to their air, um, on average, about 4.2 out of 500 students um, were infected with COVID. Now in schools that used uh, HEPA purifiers, that rate was cut roughly, roughly by 40%, right? So here we have some evidence, not perfect evidence, but we have some evidence that, using, that filtering our air using HEPA filters um, can reduce the number of, of infections. Um, so there's some evidence um, that HEPA filtration can reduce infection. Now, are, are HEPA filters some new expensive technology that we need to spend $1,000 on? Well, no. Uh, it turns out these were invented back in the 1940s. Um, these were invented during the Manhattan Project uh, when people were concerned about radioactive particles. Um, so what this means is this is really old technology. It's not expensive. It's not patented. Anybody can make a HEPA filter. This is, this is very basic technology, right? So when I learned this back when I was living in Beijing, I thought, well, I've got a fan at home and I, I could buy a HEPA filter on the internet. And so if a purifier is really just a fan and a filter, well, fan plus filter equals this. Uh, and this was the first uh, DIY purifier uh, I ever made. It's not sophisticated. It's just a fan uh, and a filter. But I did tests of this uh, in my home put the filter next to, next to my bed, put the particle counter on the other side of the room. And what I found is that even such a simple setup was enough to reduce the number of very small particles uh, in the air in my home. I later ran tests comparing that and other DIY versions to uh, the expensive purifiers, like that $1,000 purifier that I showed you before. These are all done in the same room, same particle counter, those overnight tests like I was showing you. Um, and what I found was that the, the DIY was not quite as effective as, as some of the, the larger air purifiers, but if I used a stronger fan here, which I call the Canon, um, it was able to remove as much of these small particles as those uh, expensive big brand air purifiers. So one thing that, that I've been spending years on uh, with, with Smart Air is to try to show people scientific data that I think pretty conclusive shows that clean air does not need to be a luxury. Uh, we don't need to make this a luxury good. Um, there's no need for high profit margins. It is, the technology is simple. Fans and filters have existed for uh, you know, at least 50 years. Um, so HEPA purifiers are cheap and easily available. That's, that's point number three. Now, at this point, you might ask, well, why are we filtering air? Why not just bring in uh, fresh air from, from the outside? Um, so obviously, this brings up the question of, of ventilation, right? Uh, with ventilation, you don't need to buy anything, right? Yeah, if you just open a, open a window, um, you don't need to buy anything. Uh, 
Um, we have some good data on ventilation back from uh, measles outbreaks in the United States. This is back in the, the 1960s and the 70s. And what researchers did is they, there were these outbreaks in schools, again in schools, and what they did is, it, or I'm sorry, this was in a single school, but different rooms in the schoolroom had different ventilation rates. Some had lots of outdoor air coming in, some had almost no outdoor air coming in. And what they, what they found on the y-axis here, we have the probability of catching measles uh, for different students in this, in this school. What they found is that as you increase ventilation, the odds that other students were getting infected by the measles dropped quite a lot, right? And, and the, the biggest difference there was going from basically almost zero ventilation to the two there is two air changes per hour. So you can, you can imagine that the air in the room is getting replaced twice an hour. Um, so it's quite a large effect just from ventilation alone. Now that, that study in Georgia that I talked about before, they also looked at schools that used ventilation. So I showed you before schools that did nothing, schools that used HEPA purifiers. And on the, the, the last part here, I'm gonna show you schools that increased their ventilation. So again, this could be opening doors, windows. It could also be using central air systems to increase the amount of outdoor air coming in. In those schools, um, infections were also reduced. Um, so either ventilation or HEPA filters or, you know, or filtration were both found to be uh, associated with, with lower uh, infection rates uh, in these schools. So we have some evidence that ventilation can also reduce infections. Um, one other sort of neat thing that you might be able to do uh, on your own um, or to be able to assess if you're, if you're in charge of a school or if you're you know, just concerned about your own safety, um, there's a cheap and easy proxy for indoor ventilation and for COVID risk. Um, and that is a CO2 monitor, a carbon dioxide monitor. Um, so I wanna suggest this as something that is maybe sort of a, an easy way that, that you could be able to assess risk in different areas. Um, the logic is pretty simple. CO2 comes from our bodies, right? The more people breathing in a room are gonna increase the amount of CO2. And so therefore the more CO2 that there is in a room, the more air that's coming from people's bodies uh, in the room, right? So how, do you, how would you do this? How would you get involved in this? Well, it's pretty simple. The first step, you can buy a CO2 monitor. These are not expensive. You can get them on, on the internet for less than $50. Technology is not complicated. Um, these are fairly accurate. Um, one guideline that's been suggested by uh, two researchers, um, which I cite below, um, their guideline is to get below 700 parts per million. Um, so once you have this machine, you can use this as a guideline. Obviously the lower, the better. Um, I actually have some data that I took from Delhi. Um, I went around Delhi a, a few years ago and tested the amount of CO2 indoors um, in different locations around Delhi. So you can see here on the left, um, out, that's outdoor air um, by a mall in Delhi. Outdoor air was about 500 parts per million and indoor at a restaurant that I was eating at was 2,100. So far above that, uh, that guideline, right? Here are CO2 levels that I found um, around Delhi. And you can see the red dashed line is that 700 uh, parts per million. Now this is pre-COVID, so people weren't really thinking much about ventilation, I'm sure. But you can see lots of places were uh, above that, that threshold. And so these are places where the risk of infection we can, we can predict would be larger, right? Um, if you're above that 700 ppm threshold, um, what you can do is you can ventilate or purify. Um, those would be two options, right? Now, do remember that if you're going to use a CO2 monitor to track um, this, if you're filtering the air, filtering will get rid of viruses and other particles. It won't affect CO2 levels. Um, so if you're filtering the air, CO2 becomes less relevant uh, of a metric. Um, so CO2 is not a good index in purified spaces. Finally, what about ionizers, ozone, bipolar needle point ionizers? Uh, COVID has really brought out a lot of uh, old technologies wrapped in new promises. Um, there's been a lot of press in the United States recently about there's a company called Global Plasma Solutions that's sold its uh, ionizers to schools uh, in the United States. That's led to lawsuits um, because the, the, there's a lot of um, 
evidence that some of these technologies can actually be harmful and, and may not even be helpful in the first place. Um, this is despite the fact that companies are advertising this one, this ionizer um, has this little shield on it that says it's a proven COVID killer, right? There's uh, people selling these. Um, I'm, I'm just going to talk about one uh, peer-reviewed scientific article on, on ionizers. Um, so they tested an ionizer system just like the one I showed you. And what they found is that it indeed removed uh, particles from diesel exhaust. Um, so, so it did help in some sense. Um, but that ionizer also increased the amount of NO2, which is a, a pollution, a pollutant in the air. Um, and so ionizers can actually increase forms of pollution uh, in our homes. Um, those researchers also had people breathe that air. And what they found was that breathing the ionized air uh, actually led to more uh, what are called eosinophils. Um, these are basically markers of inflammation um, damage in the body. And so even breathing ionized air was actually harming people. Um, and we have companies that are selling these things uh, to school so that our children can, can breathe them, um, supposedly because they fight COVID and yet the, the evidence there is very weak. Um, similarly, uh, we have schools that are buying ozone generators. Um, ozone is another thing that can help bring down some forms of pollution, but the problem is that ozone is also a pollutant itself. Um, so you don't want to be in a room where there is ozone being generated, right? And yet here we have schools buying these thinking that it's gonna help them fight COVID. So bottom line, avoid ionizers, ozone and other gimmicky unproven technologies. HEPA filters have been around for 70 years. We know them, we've tested them, they're vetted, we know they work. They're not the most gimmicky new technology, but they work, they're inexpensive, they're simple. There's a reason that they've been around for so long. Um, so, and I would just, just steer clear of, of unproven uh, new technologies. Um, finally, before I wrap up, I do want to remind everybody that, that my point here is that there are things, these are things that we can do to help fight COVID-19, but I, these are not substitutes for wearing masks, for distancing, vaccines, and, and other things. You, I would not just put an air purifier in a room and say, we don't have to worry about anything, right? That is not the case. Air purifiers are one element of multi-pronged strategy, right? Um, I think we all know that COVID-19 is not solved by any one thing. We need to do multiple things at the same time. Each one is gonna lower that probability um, just a little bit more. So like we saw in those Georgia schools, uh, when they used HEPA filters, the COVID infection rate was not zero, right? It was lower, but it was not zero. So it's important to remember. Um, so I hope, I've, I hope I've convinced you that there are simple low cost ways uh, to fight uh, COVID-19. Um, just going to throw out my email here. If you want to learn more uh, at, uh, at Smart Air, we're always putting out data and tests um, and summaries of scientific research like today. Um, so you can find us at Smart Air Filters um, or on, on Facebook. Um, so breathe safe, be well, and uh, um, hopefully we can all get through this uh, pandemic uh, with, with, you know, our, our health intact. So thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, that was really nice. And uh, it's always a pleasure to hear from you because I think the, the, the wonderful quality that you have is to simplify the science. A lot of people have the, the fantastic ability to complicate the science. But uh, I think, uh, as Albert Einstein said, if you can't put it simply, you really don't know it well enough, if I remember the quote correctly. So, uh, we have two very interesting questions, and I'll just take you through them. Uh, what one of them is, uh, uh, are purifiers effective in re removing the particulate matter if the room is also ventilated? That is, the windows are open. So, so I think the question is clear by itself. What is the, what's the answer? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I'll say two things about that. So one is, the, there's, there was another condition in that Georgia study that I didn't talk about. And that was the combination of both, right? So some schools used HEPA filters, some used ventilation, and some used both, right? And so then you, we could have the hypothesis, well, maybe it doesn't do anything. I mean, if you're bringing in outdoor air, why, why should we use filters, right? Um, and I honestly, I don't really know the answer to that question. Well, it turns out if you, if you calculate it in terms of a percent reduction, or I'm sorry, the percentage of risk, so the 
nothing is 100% risk. The HEPA filters and then the ventilation separately, each of those was about 60%. So they're reducing risk by about 40%, from 100% to 60%. Combining them reduced it further to about 50%. So it seemed to help a little bit more, right? Not a lot more, it wasn't double, um, but it seemed to help as well. Now at Smart Air, um, we've also run tests of this with outdoor air pollution, um, because sometimes, for example, in a Smart Air office, uh, we have a lot of people in a small space. The CO2 levels can get really high if we close all the windows. So we wanna open a window, but then outdoor air pollution sometimes is really bad. So what do we, what do, we do? Do we breathe? you know, all the CO2 or do we breathe the pollution? So what we did is we, we run tests where we open a window and then we run a purifier at the same time. And are we still able to bring down the pollution levels in the room? And what we find is that, yes, you can still uh, bring down uh, pollution levels in the room. It's not as easy. So you need more power, um, but you can do it. Um, and so basically my advice would be to try to overpower the room a little bit, get a purifier, that is rated for a larger room size than, than your room. And then you can open a window and reduce particulate pollution at the same time um, as possible. But if you have a very small purifier, it's, you know, it's probably not gonna do much if the window's open. Thanks, uh, I'll just take you to the next question. I wanna leave enough time for Mahesh also. Uh, so this question is breathing exercises are prescribed during this pandemic period and there's exercises we emit CO2 a lot. Is there any cheap and handy way to keep the house air purified that is often lived by many members? I think that what this question is trying to ask essentially is that in our context where the overcrowding is a, is, is a kind of phenomena which is very, very common. So in that context, does use of an air purifier actually reduce the risk of COVID-19 transmission? If I've got the question right. Yeah, that's a good question. So I would, I would think that it is precisely where you have people who are fairly close together, um, where you would want uh, an air purifier. I think that's, that's sort of precisely where, where you'd want to go. I think with the, with the distance between, between people, um, it's probably going to become less. So the more you can physically distance, I think the less necessary an air purifier is going to be. Now, of course, if you're, I mean, if you're standing right next to somebody, that air is going to go directly from you to the other person. Uh, but still, we have this accumulation of air in a room. Um, and so purifiers are going to are going to help with that. Particularly because you have this whole concept of asymptomatic emitters, which is established now. So that's all the more <laughs> worrying. Yeah, and there's there's really fascinating research. Um, there is now this is on the flu, not COVID-19. Um, but researchers in Maryland a few years ago uh, what they did is they took people who were sick with the flu and they put them in a machine that was pulling out, you know, all the air that they were creating. And then they, they, they measured how much infectious virus is there when they cough, when they sneeze, or just when they breathe, just breathing. And what they found is that there was infectious virus in all of it. And the difference between those was not very large, right? So simply breathing, even people who never coughed, never sneezed, we're still emitting infectious virus that the researchers could grow in the lab. And so the, the point there was that, you know, we're often, our, our attention is drawn to the person sneezing and the person coughing, but that's not a perfect indicator of, of infection risk, right? Even just breathing can, can be a risk for infection. Hey guys, Paddy again. Don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell notification below to make sure you get the latest news and stay up to date on the best ways to protect your health, your body from everything we breathe.